Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Bott, and I will be chairing this sixth uh, meeting in the Energizing the UK Battery Supply Chain uh, series. Uh, welcome to you all. So there's been a small change in the um, agenda for this afternoon. Uh, Graham Fraser Bell, who has been coming to these meetings since the beginning, uh, will talk first. Uh, unfortunately, Sam Burrow from Anafite uh, is in the middle of a funding round and his backup speaker has, quote, COVID-like symptoms. So um, Robert Bayliss, who is officially my favourite person at the moment, has stepped in with almost no notice at all and is going to talk on behalf of what's going on in Johnson Matthey. And then finally, we'll have a talk from Richard Taylor, of Green Lithium, the star of Ed Conway's Friday evening uh, energy battery energy materials supply chain a thing on sky the other week which was really very good um and then as is normal for those of you who come and for those who don't we'll move into some breakout sessions where we'll have smaller groups of people and it is a no holds barred sort of conversation there uh, and we sort of get ideas for future meetings from those so please you know tell us what you want and, and such um, the idea of actually starting to showcase the, the companies uh, came about uh, two meetings ago, so we moved to do that. And then we'll, we'll finish by about um, 3.30. And as it says at the bottom, if you could sort of make sure that your name and your organisation is in your Zoom title, it will make uh, everybody talking to you much easier in uh, the breakout sessions. So uh, that's me when I was young and pretty. The, the three speakers this afternoon. Uh, first up is, is, is Graham. As I say, Graham's been coming uh, uh, to these meetings almost since the beginning, and I will not go and explain about where he's coming from because hopefully that's what he's going to do. Uh, Graham, the floor is yours. David, thanks very much. Appreciate that. And uh, many thanks to the SCI for the introduction. Um, what I'll do is just to preserve some bandwidth, I'll switch my video off and then see if we can share this screen. So really, how does uh, NTEC Membranes play a part in energizing the UK battery supply chain? So let's let's have a look. A little bit about the heritage of NTEC International. Uh, we've actually been producing battery separators for about 38 years now. NTEC is the global number two supplier of polyethylene battery separators with a market share of about 31%. And, and when I say polyethylene battery separators, that's for automotive, two-wheeler, industrial and motive power. But if we drill down to automotive SLI, starter lighting ignition, we have a global number one supplier position. And actually we're the number one supplier of battery separators to the European OEMs. And Entech Membranes has been producing lithium ion battery separators for greater than 20 years. Now we have a combined global footprint of about 520 million square meters of battery separator materials. Uh, the group is the only manufacturer actually of polyethylene and absorptive glass mat for lead acid separators combined with polyethylene separators for lithium ion, lithium metal, lithium primary and sodium ion as well. And as, as obviously the presentation suggests we're positioned, we hope, for transformational growth within the global XEV lithium battery separator space. So a little bit about our, our competence synergies. Uh, we have six operations uh, worldwide, two in the US, one each in Indonesia, Japan, China and the UK. And what what kind of differentiates us from other separator producers is that we have a vertically integrated engineering capability that really manufactures all our own extruders, extractors and, and dryers. So that really does give us that kind of capital cost advantage. Just a kind of bird's eye view of uh, top left is uh, our Oregonian campus, we we'll make lead acid, the engineering campus and lithium. UK on the right there, Newcastle upon Tyne, Terui in Japan and uh, Bogor in Indonesia. Drilling down a little bit into, into that UK operation, it's uh, the number one supplier of lead acid separators to the European uh, OEMs. 
So we produce about 120 million square meters of separators annually in our plant in Killingworth, just outside Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, and that's enough for about 83 million automotive batteries. And I, th I think as, as most people on this call would, would know that actually all EVs still use a 12 volt lead acid auxiliary battery system. So we have polyethylene lead acid separators going into EVs. So that facility has about 142 employees. Uh, interestingly, it's positioned about nine miles south of British Vault and 12 miles north of Nissan Envision ASC. And, you know, sometimes it's just about your position and the adjacencies, the geographical adjacencies. Just a little bit about our equipment division. Uh, that really is our USP. Uh, with over 100 engineers beavering away uh, making all of our uh, extruders and extractors and really the only lithium battery equipment that we will buy in is, is really the, the machine direction and the transverse direction tentering equipment uh, from outside sources generally in, in Europe. So let's have a look at it's kind of separator 101 here what, what are the two basic processes for making separators? Well the first one is, is the dry stretch or knee Eel and stretch, dry process, crystalline regions, traditionally used in, in kind of lithium consumer applications, but it has split propensity and machine direction and projection challenges at, at thicknesses less than 16 microns, which generally rendered it unsuitable for XEV applications. The other generic process is the wet process. So it's thermally induced phase separation with plasticizer extraction. And in this case, we, we extract a mineral oil, uh, followed by biaxial orientation. And what that allows is similar machine direction and cross machine direction strength, and at thicknesses down to as low as seven microns. So actually, today, all XEV lithium ion separators are now sourced as wet process separators. And Entech operates a proprietary version of a wet process separator. So looking at the uh, unique ceramic modified separators that, that we make, I, I think you can see from these SEMs that Entech is a proponent of double side coated, both ceramic and adhesive coated separators. Um, if we look at that upper image, you can see it's a double side nanostructured alumina coated on the polyethylene, approximately 1.5 microns thickness each side. Uh, and really that's primarily for cylindrical cell applications. The lower right is a five layer double side ceramic and PVDF coated separator, predominantly for laminate pouch cell applications. But the bottom left image is, is a unique uh, product that we make and it's an alumina filled separator where the nano alumina is interspersed within the skeletal structure of the polyethylene microfibrils. As, as we know, in all different materials, you know, not all lithium ion separators are the same. In the upper left is an SEM of a, a typical SRS type separator, uh, where the ceramic and adhesive is mixed in one, one layer and is the preferred separator system for LGES. Uh, on the right, we have the kind of larger particle structure, predominantly bohemite, uh, from uh, Chinese suppliers. And then, as you can see, using the same one micron gradation on the SEM, you can see the substantially smaller particle size and homogeneous nanostructure of the Entech coating IP, which is actually the IP that we intend to onshore in the UK. Now, we've defined a, a critical threshold whereby the ceramic coat weight must be a minimum of 0.45 of the mass, polymer mass within the body of the separator. Now below this threshold, as you can see from the chart and actually the upper left SEM, the thermal shrinkage of the base PE causes buckling of the composite at the elevated temperatures. Above this threshold, so above that 0 0.45, 0 0.5, the coating locks in the structural integrity of the separator composite such that at, at 180 degrees C, well above the melting point of polyethylene, we see less than 3% shrinkage after an hour at 180 degrees C. So that, that truly is you know, remarkably 
strong thermal robustness. So let's have a, a quick look at the, the roadmap or the trends that we see for um, development. Base film, we see that going thinner, around about eight microns, a higher porosity, approximately 50%, and of course, an ever increasing demand for increased puncture. For the ceramic coatings, we're seeing increased percentage composition of uh, bohemite in that mixed ceramic coating, potential magnesium oxide inclusions, uh, reduced thickness for ER and surface modifications as well. Uh, if we look at uh, a lot of the Tesla cells in operation at the moment, quite a few of those have actually uh, aramid coating, not so much ceramics. And we see that shifting both in terms of cost and supply drivers towards ceramic. And then adhesive coatings, uh, reduced thickness, uh, multi-layer as with ourselves, so kind of five layer, looking at novel adhesives. And it's really the growth or the conversion to pouch form factor that's driving that growth. So big thanks here to uh, our friends at the, the APC uh, for providing the support data for this slide, which shows that UK lithium demand increasing from a total of about three gigawatt hours in 2020. Um, so to 96 gigawatt hours by 2030. So a 32 fold increase in gigawatt hour demand and clearly the BEV there representing the lion's share of 96% in, in 2030. So what does that mean? Uh, what does that equate to really in terms of lithium battery separator demand? What we try to show here is that that volume or the area of separators that would be required to meet that demand. So if the UK demand for lithium batteries increases from three gigawatt hours in 2020 to 96 in 2030, that's equivalent to a 38 fold increase of lithium battery separators from 30 million square meters to about 1.15 billion square meters by 2030. And as as people may be aware, the separator actually comprises a strategically vital component of those cells and represents about nine to 12 percent of the material cost of a lithium ion cell. So at present, all of these separators are imported from China and Japan with a value in 2020 of approximately 22 million pounds. So if we are unable to justify investment in the UK's first lithium battery separator facility, then by 2030, the UK will be importing up to 760 million pounds worth of separated materials, three quarters of a billion pounds worth of, of imports with no offset of domestic onshore production. So what are we doing uh, as, as, as NTEC? What are we doing to try and plan for that? So we need to position to comply with the rules of origin and the regional content which by 1st of January 2024 requires lithium battery materials in the, in the batteries to be 50% originating material, increasing to 65% from 2027. So we've got to start work now. And as such, uh, we're working on sourcing of appropriate strategic material components, ideally within the UK, but essentially within the EU. At the bottom there, the critical component we need to source is the mix of ultra high, high density in LDPEs. Uh, we see developing sources of PVDF and polyvinyl alcohol in Europe, which is promising. It's interesting to see that one of the UK's seven oil refineries may have the capability to supply white paraffinic processing oils for us. We're working on REACH compliant solvent systems and we're developing sources of HPA, uh, high purity alumina and bohemite and I think in that respect, it's pleasing to see developments by advanced energy systems in Cornwall towards this as, as a possible partner in that supply chain. So how does that then map out in terms of those critical materials? So in 2020, there was probably about 195 tons of polyethylene polymers used in the lithium battery separator supply chain in the UK. By 2025, we see that increasing to about 2,600 tons and about 7,500 tons of mixed polyethylenes by 2030. 
Similarly for ceramics, perhaps about 150 tons used in 2020, increasing to 2,200 tons 2025, and then about 6,400 tons by 2030. So really, Entec is positioned at the epicenter of the UK's number one regional hub, supply chain hub. Um, I think a lot of people are aware of the MOU that we signed with British Volta in 2021 with Peranum lithium battery separator facility co-located on the campus primarily to take advantage of renewable energy. But there is no guarantee of product approval or supply agreement and certainly no cross equity. So we still got a long way to go, but we need to be in a position to supply British Volta demands as well as other UK lithium battery manufacturers and to act as a staging point for supply into the European lithium battery manufacturers. So thank you very much for your time and I look forward to catching up in, in the breakout rooms. Okay, thank you, Graham. Excellent. Uh, also tidy, I think mix on the call somewhere, so I'm sure he was being pleased by our AEM name check. Um, okay, most of the conversation goes on in, in the um, uh, the breakout rooms. So uh, it's next, it's it's up for uh, Robert. Robert Bayliss, are you ready? Yep, just gonna share it now. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. Okay, so um, yeah, following on um, nicely actually to have that introduction uh, from Graham, but um, the uh, separator business, we're gonna talk about two of the other active materials in the lithium ion battery value chain uh, with a focus on the, the cathode material industry, which Johnson Matthey um, had active operations in for, for lithium ion phosphate in uh, plant in uh, Quebec in Canada. And then we were building out our high nickel um, cathode material uh, production in, in Poland with, with plants for uh, Finland as well. Unfortunately, uh, as you all have been made aware in the press, that John Smith decided to exit this business. So there's currently a, a sale process underway. Um, and um, we're sort of waiting to see where, where that will lead us. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I thought we'd give you a bit of a, a sort of quick intro to the sort of value chain steps in the um, cathode and, and anode uh, space. Uh, so first thing to say, um, and uh, this was already introduced in the uh, last presentation when we were talking about separators, that active materials within the lithium-ion battery value chain predominantly start with mined raw materials. Um, uh, lithium-ion battery contains very little content in terms of uh, organic uh, materials. And what we see is um, quite an abundance of transition metal elements within um, lithium-ion battery active materials. And in these two charts here, which are uh, rather sort of scientific, but, but gives you some sort of idea about um, their abundance and cost. Um, and that's important to consider when we think about the sort of future for these um, active materials. And on the left-hand side, you can see the elements that we're sort of interested in for, for cathode active materials predominantly with some of the um, uh, anode in there as well, like silicon, that um, generally these materials are, are quite um, widely available, particularly compared to say, platinum group metal elements, which uh, John Smathy is perhaps a little bit better known for in, the, in regards to its um, automotive catalyst business. Um, but nonetheless, if you look at that sort of middle section where we sort of focused on nickel and cobalt, two of the main elements for these um, nickel, uh, high nickel chemistry uh, materials that um, they're generally more expensive than the more common uh, sort of bulk metals we see in the market today, um, largely due to their uh, smaller abundance. Um, and then if we look on the right in terms of um, some of the other sort of elements that, that come into the mix, particularly like lithium and uh, carbon, uh, phosphorus, um, those materials are, uh, are sort of slightly more widely available uh, compared to the sort of nickel and, and cobalt. Um, but, um, you know, not, not materially so, and, and you can sort of see that reflected in the sort of prices of, of materials, lithium, for example, generally quoted at um, like a lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide price, which is already quite high. You know, we've seen some startling numbers coming for this year. But if you were to 
look at that on a, a sort of pure metal basis, it would be even more expensive than, than cobalt and, and nickel. Um, and, and therefore, you know, really goes to sort of show that even something that's slightly more widely uh, distributed in the Earth's crust and um, seemingly something that should be slightly cheaper to, to get out of the ground uh, can still be quite problematic and expensive to, to do so. Um, and uh, as a last presentation, we mustn't forget the sort of lead acid business. And, and really, you could sort of say that, um, you know, lead uh, isn't much more widely available than, than cobalt and nickel. Um, but, you know, a whole industry has been built around it. And what we see in that industry today is uh, a very efficient recycling system that, you know, over 90% of, of the lead going into lead acid batteries is recovered. And, and that, I think, you know, gives us hope for the future for some of these rarer uh, metals that are used in lithium ion batteries that we'll be able to recover those and, and reuse them in a more efficient way uh, when, when the sort of industry starts to mature. When we look at the upstream uh, for the various um, raw materials going into to cathode and, and anode active materials, it's quite a similar picture in terms of the value chain. Um, so most products, you know, start with mining out of the ground. Lithium is perhaps uh, one of the main exceptions where you have elevated concentrations in certain uh, water environments, um, meaning you, you sort of get a lithium enriched brine as opposed to a, a mineral environment. There's typically a concentration step for most of these materials, followed by a refining or purification stage. And then conventionally, there would be a, a sort of conversion or, or upgrade to battery quality standards that the industry requires then to blend or manufacture into the actual active materials them, themselves. And, and where Johnson Mathe was, was sort of playing was in this precursor and cathode sort of step of the, of the value chain, taking um, mainly nickel and cobalt and lithium in, in salt form, um, converting that to, to a precursor initially and, and then uh, producing the cathode materials via calcination, lithiation, that we then supply to the lithium ion battery cell manufacturers for, for onward use through to various applications, but, but in particular the automotive industry. Um, for the anode side at, at the bottom there, it, it's, it's similar. Um, except th there isn't so much of a sort of precursor step where you would blend materials together. Conventionally, you would take your sort of carbon in graphite form, synthetic or natural, as shown here, and, and take it all the way through to, to an anode. Um, however, with the sort of advent of, of sort of silicon doped graphite anodes, uh, we are seeing you know, silicon material enter there and, and potentially, of course, uh, maybe a, you know, a, a complete silicon anode in, in future should um, the technology mature enough to stabilize that material for long cycle life. So first looking at the, the sort of precursor step of, of the value chain. So here's where we take our uh, various um, metal sulfates um, and we add some dopants to these. And, and the, the reason you do that is, is mainly to change the way that um, the precursor uh, crystal structure uh, uh, sort of appears um, when you um, when you uh, subject that to uh, the sort of reaction phase. Um, and you also require some other um, reagents as well within that for pH control and chelation, which is sort of actually getting these metals to uh, sort of bond together in, in a mixed sulfates uh, form. Um, once you sort of put all of these materials together in the reaction step, uh, you filter the product, you dry it, and, and you end up with a, a mixed metal hydroxide, which is typically called your, your sort of precursor or PCAMP of some description. Um, and that material is then sort of sent on to the, the dry end of the facility, which is where you uh, form your cathode material. We'll see that on, on the next slide. One of the, the sort of key outputs from this process, because you're converting from um, mixed sulfates to hydroxide, is um, through the reaction, you produce um, uh, sodium sulfate, uh, and this is typically stripped out in your um, effluent treatment plant, um, where you also aim to uh, capture the ammonia, which you know can't uh, emit to the air, and also uh, recover as much water as possible to to put back into the system to dissolve uh, a lot of those salts that are coming in crystal form. Um, and the sodium sulfate can be uh, dried and then bagged and, and sold, um, but 
one of the challenges for this industry, but also for the, the upstream raw materials is that um, sodium sulfate's uh, not a very large uh, market, especially outside of, of Asia. And um, it's also a, a problematic uh, byproduct to dispose of uh, because it forms a, a gel like substance if you expose it to moisture or water. So one of the big challenges for the industry, uh, particularly for uh, lithium production, but, but also for the precursor production is, is what to do with the sodium sulfates. Um, and there's various um, options under review, including Johnson Matthey had some innovative technology to uh, convert that material back to some of the reagents that we require at the front end. And, and other companies, uh, for example, uh, Northolt plan to uh, react it with potassium to make potassium sulfate, which is a, a macronutrient for uh, growing crops. So there are some options coming, but um, I think uh, you know more could be done to uh, try and solve that, that headache for, for this part of the value chain. In the sort of final step of the cathode material production, this is where we bring in our precursor from the last uh, slide, together with, with various coatings and, and then your lithium. Um, and those products are mixed, loaded into uh, sort of refractory saggers, um, and then uh, subjected to, to calcination at high temperature where you convert your hydroxide to, to oxide and your lithium uh, becomes incorporated into the, the cathode material. You would then uh, mill and grade that product um, because typically it would come out as agglomerated, screen it for any magnetic impurities that, that have come from uh, various stages of the process, and then uh, blend it uh, if you're sort of seeking to uh, create a, a product that maybe has um, a, a sort of variable particle size or, or specific particle size requirement from the customer. And this is what forms your, your cathode adapter material or CAM, as it's quite commonly known in the industry. And that will go um, off to the, the cell plant. The nuance around the, the sort of coatings area is that um, particularly for high nickel uh, chemistries where you have um, low cobalt manganese content, uh, the stability of that cathode material um, in the lifetime of the cell um, you know, can be can be a bit problematic and, and what the coatings generally tend to do is sort of stabilize your crystal structure uh, and prevent uh, damage to it from uh, the process of the lithium ion uh, generation in and out of the, the cathode material sort of self. Um, and here we see, you know, a variety of novel coatings used, uh, things like uh, alumina or zirconia uh, can, can be used here and, and have shown good effects, you know, for, for a long time in uh, creating more uh, high performing cathode materials. Uh, throughout both of the processes for precursor and cathode material production, you generate uh, yield losses. Um, these can come at many of the different sort of steps, including, uh, you know, where you have OSPEC material that, that doesn't meet the, the quality or uh, the specification for, for the customer. And these products can be recovered um, and they're potentially easier to recover than, than say, end of life or uh, value chain uh, material that comes from the cell or pack step um, because you've yet to combine them with uh, other metals or other products or any organic or uh, fluorine containing components of the, the sort of later steps. Um, so uh, we expect to see, uh, you know, an ecosystem that is sort of set up to uh, recover a lot of these uh, yield losses uh, as the industry grows in size. In terms of how this sort of looks because these plants aren't very common. Um, we generally don't, don't see too many outside of Asia. Those that are, are coming are still rather sort of under construction, e even here in Europe uh, and now North America. Generally, the, the footprint of the actual um, facility for making precursor or cathode material is, is quite small, but of course, you need quite a lot of ancillary buildings um, to enable their production. Um, so, this sort of shows a a sort of schematic of how that sort of site would be structured with, with all of the ancillary parts located around it. Um, materials coming in at the left and going out the sort of top right and how you would sort of treat your uh, effluent as well as a, a sort of key component. And on the right hand side you sort of see a, a kind of image of our uh, planned Kona facility in Poland now. Uh, sort of work has stopped there but that's how it would have looked upon completion. So sort of get an idea of particularly what that sort of type facility uh, looks like.
On the anode side, uh, it's not, not an area um, that uh, Johnson Matthew has been uh, undertaking actively to pursue, but um, just to give you some sort of idea, um, you know, really then to give you the kind of full active material spectrum across, you know, cathode, anode, and the separator. Um, two main forms of uh, anode used from a carbon perspective, synthetic graphite or natural graphite. Uh, if we take the synthetic graphite route, what generally start with is, is coke. So this is a, a byproduct of the petrochemical industry. Uh, that product um, is high carbon, um, generally has some impurities, and it's quite homogeneous. Um, and effectively what the process tries to do is uh, graphitize the, the, the carbon um, to form a, a synthetic graphite. So tries to do what nature has done for, for natural graphite. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to um, create the sort of pressure and temperature environment that natural graphite forms that. So generally synthetic graphite uh, does tend to be more uh, consistent and homogeneous, but sort of lacks the sort of flake composition that we see for, for, for natural graphite. So uh, performs, but, but generally doesn't perform quite as well as, as natural graphite in lithium ion batteries. For the natural graphite step, so sort of rather more simplified value chain or resort for cathode materials. Um, here we take natural graphite, typical upstream mining and then uh, leaching phase to strip out uh, impurities. And then what generally tends to happen is uh, this spherosalization step to uh, sort of round the, um, the flakes and then they're purified and, and then coated uh, with, with a subst substance. And that tends to form your, your graphite anode. So between synthetic graphite and natural graphite, there are some sort of crossovers, um, but um, effectively resulting in, in a similar type of uh, carbon uh, structure that, that would form your anode. Of course, the interest is to uh, improve the performance of, of the anode. And one of the constraints around graphite is its low capacity, uh, even you know, the very specialized uh, synthetic, uh, sorry, spherotized coated natural graphite generally has a low capacity, lower than what you see for, for a cathode. Um, however, it's a very stable material, um, performs very well. Where we've seen um, a lot of interest and, and commercialization in recent years is the addition of, of silicon. Uh, silicon in comparison to, to graphite has a very high capacity, more than tenfold. Um, however, uh, upon uh, lithiation, it, it swells. Um, and of course, uh, in a tightly packed lithium ion battery, this can be problematic. Um, so where the research has tended to focus is trying to effectively prevent silicon from, from expanding. And here we see sort of the use of nanomaterials, silicon oxide, silicon oxide coatings, but the um, loading is quite small, maybe five now coming up sort of 10 or so 15% uh, of the natural graphite loaded with, with silicon. And that gives it a small performance boost, but does have some impact on uh, cycle life occasionally. So um, may not be such a robust material, uh, a sort of a downside to the improved uh, capacity that it creates. When we look at the, the sort of market landscape for um, active materials in, in Europe, um, there's not a lot sort of going on in, in the UK. Uh, that may change, um, as the last speaker mentioned around rules of origin. It would be expected that you know someone would, would build a cathode material facility in the UK to support the likes of uh, Envision or uh, British Vault or uh, Amti or one of the other projects that, that are under review. Um, but as it stands, most uh, cathode active material production shown on the right hand side is taking place in, in mainland Europe or northern Europe. Um, so we see. BSF active um, producing precursor in uh, Finland, shipping that to Germany to make cathode material production. Both plants uh, only currently sort of finalizing construction will be in operation later this year. Uh, Umicore, similar setup, precursor production in Finland and cathode material production in, in Poland. Um, and then John Smathy did plan uh, and had a plant under construction in, in Konin in Poland. Um, and then we plan to do a precursor and cathode material production also in, in Finland, which, um, you know, maybe someone will, will consider continuing in, in future, uh, given the domestic resources there, but also uh, many of the, the new gigafactories popping up in, in uh, Scandinavia. 
Uh, when we look on the anode side, on, on the left-hand side of this chart, we can see that um, a lot of the concentration, again, is in, in Scandinavia, particularly for uh, graphite in Norway and, and Sweden. Um, and there, there are some existing producers in mainland Europe, in uh, Germany, SGL, and in France, Carbon, Suavois. Um, and feeding these uh, plants predominantly is imported material currently, but there are a number of um, producers of, of active, um, sorry, of battery active raw materials that, that could come to fruition and present um, the potential for more of a, a domestic uh, value chain spanning into the upstream. There is already uh, nickel and cobalt production in Europe, particularly in Norway and, and Finland. Um, however, the forms that these plants produce aren't the most suitable for cathode material production. So there generally has to be some steps to convert them into a, a sort of value chain usable feedstock. Uh, for lithium, there is some product conversion in Europe, but, but no uh, domestic production of, of any substantial amount. Um, however, that may change with uh, the likes of uh, projects in Iberia, in Central Europe, uh, also in Scandinavia as well. Um, and then, as uh, Richard will explain, some opportunity for uh, lithium refining based on domestic or imported concentrates of raw materials that could spring up uh, at various locations around Europe in the future. So at the moment, the, the industry is, is quite uh, immature. Um, it's certainly from a pure production perspective, both for raw material and cathode and active materials lagging the, the gigafactory construction, uh, but we expect that that will likely uh, change in future as uh, more production comes to feed those facilities, uh, both here in the UK, but also in Europe, mainland Europe as well. And that's all I've got to say today, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, Robert, sorry, um, uh, particularly for, for you know, you didn't know about this at nine o'clock this morning, so I, we're, we're all eternally grateful. Um, and and I, I love the fact that only in a Johnson Matthey presentation can you have a comparison as cheaper than platinum. That's absolutely sparse. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, last and by no means least, uh, it, it's Richard from uh, Green Lithium. And uh, I suspect there's going to be a lot of, of congruence uh, in the presentation we're about to hear. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David, and thank you very much, uh, you know, Graham and Robert, you've teed me up exceptionally well. Um, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to see the amount of sort of uh, knowledge and actually how the supply chain is, even that with Johnson Matthews uh, sort of bowing out of the cathode market, it's still great to see all that sort of expertise within the UK in that sector. So whoever picks up that... Uh, link in the supply chain I'm, I'm sure is going to have uh, a rapturous applause to that so uh, with no <laughs> I, I will uh, take you through what, what we're doing in the uh, in the supply chain that will hopefully uh, add one of the other links so please just excuse me so um those of you who um don't know or have not been introduced uh, I'm Richard Taylor, I'm founding director of Green Lithium. Uh, Green Lithium was originally started, um, or, well, about four, and a half, four years, nine months ago. And the idea was, after the signing of the Paris Agreement, um, we realised, or I realised that there was going to be a, a need for localization of supply chains, particularly in the, the battery sector, so that we could ultimately... Uh, have batteries for mobility, whether it be electric of electric vehicles and stationary energy storage. Uh, originally, looking uh, to my background, which is a, as a geologist, um, uh, rolled out the maps and said, "Let's have a look if the UK is sitting on any good rocks that could ultimately yield um, commercial amounts of lithium." Um, and off the back of that, we could look to then build, you know, with partners, a supply chain uh, to, to support the uh, transition to green energy. Um, so the history of it is uh, that we initially had a look at the hard rock potential of the UK and, and actually realised that 
you know, because this is looming so quickly on us that we actually should be addressing probably the next step, which is the refining capability, because there was uh, mines in production in other areas of the world that could ship a concentrate to the UK. Um, if we had the refining capability, that would be a quicker step to ensure that we had the raw materials needed to produce the cathodes that uh, Robert alluded to, and then equally the batteries and the electric vehicles after that. If we could have that refining part in the UK, um, it, we could take our time uh, or companies could take their time in developing the natural resources that may or may not of, of volume be in the actual rocks or in the brines in the UK, but we could actually have a part of the supply chain, the refining step to hang the rest of the industry off locally. So uh, we, you know, <laughs> because traditionally it takes a lot longer to bring a mine to production than it would a gigafactory, for instance. So it was more about getting the material there in the time needed to be able to support this kind of localization of supply chain. So we focused the attention then after looking at lots of different rocks in the UK uh, and processing them, uh, we then looked to actually say, well, what, what's it going to need for us to actually bring that refining capability to the UK to act as that cornerstone of the battery supply chain uh, for the rest of the supply chain to be hung off. So uh, we pivoted the business model um, around about two years ago and we've been building the team um, and all the other aspects of that around it, suppliers, the technology. And, there's a, and basically what we're trying to do is not just put a, a normal refining capability there. It's actually a very progressive green refinery where we can actually demonstrate our carbon impact and also encourage the supply chain around us to also be able to reduce their carbon impact wherever possible. And uh, I'll go on to talk to you a bit about our LCA, uh, our uh, life cycle assessment for carbon um, over the next couple of slides, but the green really is in green lithium. So, uh, and it's, it's not, a, not a green washing type of thing. So uh, to start off our mission is to enable the transition to sustainable energy as at a high level. And we will be, as a vision, it, we will enable the acceleration and adoption of electric vehicles and sustainable energy storage by increasing the supply of low carbon battery grade lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate. Um, I'll share these details with you soon, but uh, they're just my details. So as explained by uh, Robert and, and you know what the theme is of this talk is, is ultimately this supply chain and, and where things sit. So the, the current supply chain uh, for lithium, um, it, there, there, there are abundant international reserves of lithium coming on online, um, some of them Western Australia, we're now seeing um, more and more looking like they're going to be coming online in uh, Africa and Canada. And ultimately, they all get sent to refineries, all the hard rock spodumene, which is the feed material that we are focusing on, is sent to uh, Asia to be refined. And that material is then sent to European uh, cathode manufacturers, so as Robert described, um, which is then processed further. And, you know, we think that there is going to be uh, into cells and into EVs, but we think there's an opportunity to be able to get as much of this supply chain in the UK as possible. Um, we, so what we are proposing is that we build a lithium refinery that will produce 50,000 tonnes of lithium hydroxide. Um, this Ultimately, roundabout would be the 27% of the 2030 demand for the, for, well, for the European demand for lithium hydroxide. So this is by no means a, uh, a complete solution. Um, 50,000 tonne refinery is still a very large refinery, but it's more showing the actual scale of demand uh, for 2030. So 50,000 tonnes will make the probably equivalent of about a million electric vehicles. 
Um, but we definitely see that it, that it's for the UK to have a refinery, it'll allow the rest of the supply chain to be built within the UK or, or enable uh, the localization of that supply chain to be built in the UK. Um, we do then foresee that there will be other localized refineries that will support other localized um, supply chains across Europe and in other geographies of the world. Um, so it's by no means we are the silver bullet. Um, this is a it will be a replicable process. So hopefully if we build the first one, then we can look to build further refineries in other locations um, of which we've already had in uh, a lot of interest uh, around. So just looking at the supply chain distribution, just to sort of illustrate it, we can see that um, you know, if we're looking at uh, the, the lithium raw material, mining predominantly is in Western Australia. Refining, you can see there on the second column is 89% uh, is in China. Um, and then varying degrees on the electrochemicals or the cathode side of things, cell production and battery assembly. It ultimately points out that we are very uh, dependent on Chinese production uh, or, and refining. Um, as a part of this crucial critical uh, supply chain and something that we feel very strongly uh, that we should be securing in the UK to not only um, control the green credentials around it, but also to control and be able to enable the rest of the uh, UK battery supply chain. So again, illustrating it a bit further um, on just where lithium comes from, where the sort of nickel have come from. Obviously here showing the cobalt coming from uh, the DRC. Um, and the majority of it is then uh, refined in China and then shipped to Europe then uh, as a battery cell or for the materials for, for battery cells as these gigafactories are, um, you know, gearing up. So what does that gearing up picture look like and why do we need the stream of lithium so, uh, so in, well, in such haste. It, it's, it's really this. I mean, it's astronomical the amount of battery fa factories that are now looking and proposed to be built. Um, and all of these are going to need uh, lithium, the predominantly lithium hydroxide um, and high nickel cathodes. Um, but I think, you know, you've got uh, some in there like Freya uh, that are looking to uh, take lithium carbonate as well. Our process will be able to produce both lithium hydroxide and uh, lithium carbonate, depending on, on what the market needs. We will have two production lines, uh, both producing 25,000 tonnes um, of lithium hydroxide equivalent. Um, and we will be feeding them from mines um, in a vicinity of places. So uh, this diagram shows material coming in spodumene form from um, Australia, Africa and Canada. And what we can do with that, we can take a supply chain that was otherwise dominated by China and enable the uh, UK and EU supply chain um, to flourish for all of the gigafactories uh, that, that were proposed on the previous slide. Now, we, we can accept other feed materials such as um, technical grade lithium carbonate and upgrade that to a battery grade lithium hydroxide. Um, so we could take, for instance, carbonates that were produced in South America from many of the brine projects down there and, uh, and, and convert that into a, uh, in, into a battery grade hydroxide, more amenable to a lot of the proposed gigafactories within Europe. We are also now looking at how we can take um, some of the black mass or a refined black mass product from recycled batteries, um, because ultimately what our process is, um, is a very large calcination uh, side of things. Then it goes into a chemical side. So the hydrometallurgy, um, we've, we've opted for an alkali hydrometallurgy second step rather than the Chinese uh, step, which is an acid based uh, process. Uh, and this ultimately means that our 
uh, co-product is an inert and alcine sand um, for which we have got uh, many exciting uh, uses for um, and a lot of them promote low carbon uh, a low carbon society that's all we can sort of say at the moment because a lot of it is very exciting and uh, and ip driven um so uh, it, and it ultimately in in china they have to then dispose of a well the acid that they use as well which can be uh, quite quite damaging on, on the environment um i'll go further onto our green credentials in a moment and not uh, spoil the uh, the excitement so here we are so how are we doing this in a actual green way and putting the green in green lithium and being able to support a localized low carbon uk and european battery manufacturing sector so to demonstrate this and to demonstrate it's not lip service we've commissioned a life cycle assessment by Minvero. now what this is it's a about taking accountability for our impact on the environment, but then also encouraging our supply chain partners to also take accountability and come up with a plan to net zero. So it doesn't say you have to start off um, producing, uh, you know, or limiting your effects on the environment, but at least have a plan in place and an achievable plan in place that you can demonstrate to us as our potential buyers and also for, for us to be demonstrating to our potential customers that we are using suppliers that are trying to reduce uh, their impact on the environment at, at every stage. Um, so it's uh, what we can see from this is that we've had this uh, life cycle assessment done. And if we were to show the the base case, if we were, were not to have progressed our uh, net zero roadmap, we would be coming out at producing 12 grams um, of CO2 per gram of lithium hydroxide. Uh, and that's compared to China, China who produced 16 grams um, of CO2 per, per kilogram of lithium hydroxide. So we're, we're already coming up in under what the current uh, production of CO2 is. We then put a carbon reduction strategy in place, which I'll go on to in the next slide, which brings us down to three grams of CO2. And we're hoping to reduce that even further, which means that we can eradicate our scope one, scope two uh, and scope three uh, emissions. And scope three is, is, is also involving our other supply chain partners, the mines and making sure that they have a plan to net zero and actually an achievable plan. Uh, and also then are the cathode manufacturers that will then serve. So because ultimately what we want to be doing is providing a, a low carbon supply chain. So when we all jump in our electric vehicles, um, we can say that this this is a proven auditable, uh, accountable supply chain that has done everything possible to uh, reduce its impact on the environment. And we can actually, you know, be a green economy um, without uh, it all just being a marketing uh, sort of front. So what we're doing and our plan to do this, um, decarbonizing a refining step is something that I know a few companies are, are trying, um, but you know, what the main points to, to our carbon reduction plan um, over uh, the years until 2030, is to first of, first of all, we've, we've got a, the first stage is a big calcinization stage. And we are looking where we would usually burn natural gas. Um, we'd look to put a natural gas green hydrogen blend in all of our um, calcinization is a hydrogen ready process. So this isn't something that's going to be retrofitted to the calciners. This is something that we've built the calciners with our technology partners, or we're building the calciners with our technology partners to be able to accept um, hydrogen as, as, a, as a bead material. And what we'll do, we'll gradually increase um, the green hydrogen to natural gas mix um, as, as and when green hydrogen is available and also economic on our site. So we're even looking at the installation of a green hydrogen electrolyzer on our site, um, which will be able to uh, obviously fuel, fuel the calciner. So that's very exciting. That brings the emissions down. Uh, we'll also look to get a renewable energy P2 
PPA agreement. So rather than taking electricity from the grid, we will look to just um, take it from renewable energy sources only. Um, and also then really to push that scope three um, carbon emission, we are looking to link up our LCAs with LCAs that our suppliers, so the mines have done. So we, we took, obviously we, with speaking with and we've collaborated with um, a few of the mines um, in Western Australia on actually linking our LCAs up. So it really then demonstrates to the cathode manufacturers in Europe, whether this be BASF or Umicor, um, that you know this you know this means a lot to us, and, and we're only selecting our uh, suppliers that, that that are making. The, the cut in, in the sense that they're aware of the current carbon emissions and they've got a plan in place to be able to reduce that over time. Um, and we really think that this is hard currency now. It's, um, it's not a case of, you know, it's, it's a, a bonus to have uh, a carbon reduction plan. It's a necessity. And that's certainly something that we are looking to hold our suppliers accountable for too. And one that we think is, should be a guiding principle of the development of a UK battery supply chain you know we can be the best at this and we can set the bar very high we've got the uh we've certainly got the skills and uh, the human capital and the people that can be able to deliver that to uh, these very uh entrepreneurial but also achievable uh goals within the uk so what we ultimately want to do and a part part of this call really is we want to bring together the supply chain and i think what the guys have said, um, Graham and Robert, have really emphasised that, you know, we've got some absolutely fantastic talent in the UK and fantastic businesses that, you know, are really able to support a, a, a UK battery uh, supply chain. One that I'm, I'm certainly very confident that we can all do together. And we've actually got very little time, but we have got time to be able to pull together and say, right, you know, Johnson Matthews just pulled out of the uh, the race. There's a there is a cathode space there. You know, we can market it together um, to cathode manufacturers. It's a fantastic place to be able to set up uh, set up a uh, cathode facility in the UK. Um, and we do this through promoting collaboration, encouraging vertical integration, and um, and really promoting regional development. So. To what Graham was saying, you know that they've they've set up um, in the northeast, very close to British Vault Nissan. Um, it's absolutely fantastic, and we think there'll be a lot, a lot coming from that of co-location. Um, so you know we're here to help promote a battery Britain story, and that's the kind of flag that uh, we call this collaboration under. And it's not about it's not about one individual company achieving, it's about the whole supply chain achieving together um, and demonstrating to the rest of the world, actually Britain's one of the best places to build this supply chain um, be because of all the, uh, all the things that are already in place. Um, and I know a lot of people on this call have been working for many, many years in this space, but I feel like there's, be no better time to bang this drum very very hard and promote the uk as a wonderful place and a place that is going to be leading the world in in uh, battery production under that uh, battery britain uh, kind of rhetoric so uh, yes thank you very much for having me and uh, looking forward to the out uh, 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 well the, the workshop meetings in a moment richard thank you very much uh, so um Brilliant three talks, very different, but very similar in many ways in ethos. If you're not already a member of SCI, why not? It's a really wonderful group of people. Uh, and it's actually the cheapest uh, uh, chemistry based thing you can join. So, I mean, there are all sorts of things you get out of it. We have a really cool headquarters in Belgrave Square, which has great rooms. We have journals. Uh, we have all sorts of things. Uh, go look us up if you have any problems or uh, questions. Uh, ask me or Shreya uh, and and but you know thank you very much for coming along and you know watch your watch your, your diaries we'll, we'll let you know when the next one is thank you very much thanks everyone Cheers. bye, -bye. Thank, you. Bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye thank you thank you all excellent thank you bye bye